Hi, I'm Ed O'Keefe, CBS News, traveling with President Biden in Denver, Colorado. He's out here campaigning for Congress. We'll explain that in a little bit, but first, let's take a look back at the week that was. I hereby pardon Liberty and Bell. So Thanksgiving came and went, and so did the turkey party. We can all give thanks to the gift that is our nation. That gave everyone a chance to step away from what's expected to be a pretty intense year-end rush on Capitol Hill and the closing weeks of the Iowa caucus. News still broke, however, during the holiday weekend. As Israeli hostages taken captive during the October 7th attacks were released by the terrorist organization Hamas as part of a temporary ceasefire deal brokered by the United States and Qatar. There were some Americans among them, like dual citizen Abigail Moore Edan, a four-year-old. Her aunt spoke with CBS News's Holly Williams. All of Israel and all of the world want to know how she's doing. And we just have to keep it private and just let her be a little girl. Um, what's it been like for your family to have her come home? Wow. <laughs> it's like a dream come true because we were in a nightmare. I felt from the 7th of October, I'm in a nightmare. And Please, somebody can just wake me up from this nightmare. I couldn't believe what happened to us. I couldn't believe it. And when she came back, it was, I think, the first time I could do <sighs> like this and maybe think of sleeping at night. I mean, because we, it was so hard because we lost, we lost members of our family and parents. And, um, and it has been so hard. So I'm so happy that she's here. And uh, she's like uh, Israel's uh, little, little baby. Everybody feels her as her own baby. So I'm getting like a, a adopt adoption uh, requests every day because everybody wants to adopt Guli um, she, because she's so amazing and sweet. And she's like Israel's uh, new child, even uh, Biden's uh, grand, um, granddaughter. <laughs> Reached out to you? Uh, yeah, he spoke with the family. He, he spoke to a member of the family yesterday. He was very happy that he was released. So thank you so much, Biden, for being there for us. She's free, and Jill and I, together with so many Americans, are praying for the fact that she is going to be all right. Yeah, I really feel he's a, a new member in the family. <laughs> he's like a grandfather. <laughs> C can I ask what President Biden said? No, he said he was very happy that she's released, and he asked how she's doing. And we were shocked. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people in the U.S. have been following this story closely. I know, I know. I mean, we're getting so much love from U.S., and so much love, and so much support, and thank you for that. Thank you for being there for us. And I also want to say to all the people that want to adopt Guli <laughs> that she has a family. She has a family where surrounding her and with love and care and protecting her. So thank you for everybody, but we, she doesn't need to be adopted. <laughs> and uh, Your family are going to raise her? She has, yeah, the family is going to look after her, so it's going to be okay. And I have to ask people just to, you know, she's four and she's been s through s terrible things, I, I, I guess, you know, it's not, uh, not nice to be in Gaza. And um, I just need the people to, to, to give her some peace and quiet and, you know, to leave her alone, just to leave her to be a little girl with her family and to let us give her love and hope and heal her um, with all she's been through. What kind of a little girl is Abigail? She's so sweet. She's a sweet little girl. Very sweet, very happy, very shy. Um, she loves popsicles. Very sweet. This is a difficult question. Does she know that she's lost her parents? I don't know. I don't know. It's so much for a four-year-old. It's so much. Yeah, so it's something I can't answer. Thank you so much. I can say something. Yes, can I say, say something? something else, of course, yeah. I, in, we have in Tel Aviv a hostage center that they support the hostage families. And they are like my angels. I, I would never survive without them. Our Guli is back home. So my heart is 
a little bit uh, better right now, but there are still so many people, amazing people, and children, and women, and men that are still there in Gaza, and we have to bring them back. It's not enough. It's not enough to bring only 13 people at a time. It's not enough. We have to bring them back. And our hearts will be healed again. So it's very important for me. You'll be healed when they're all home. Yeah. I, I'm a mother of two sons. How can I be happy if all other sons are still there by Hamas? How can I sleep at night? I can't. So I'm happy that Guli's home, but there are so many people that need help right now. So we'll not, we'll not stop until everyone is back. Protesters found ways to be heard during the Thanksgiving weekend. Um, when this war began, it affected me tremendously. I was devastated, I was heartbroken. Um, and ever since then, I felt like it has been my duty to fight for Palestinians, to fight for my brothers and sisters in Gaza. Amid growing pressure from fellow Democrats to place conditions on future military aid to Israel. So if you want money from the United States, you know what? You gotta hear what we want as well. We just can't get a blank check. President Biden, for the first time, suggested he's open to the idea. Well, I think that's a, 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 a worthwhile thought, but I don't think if I started off with that, we'd ever gotten to where we are today. We have to take this a piece at a time. President Biden was asked uh, this past week about the call by some of his fellow Democrats uh, to put conditions on military aid to Israel, and he said it was, quote, a worthwhile thought. What specific conditions are you considering putting on U.S. aid? Well, Margaret, what the president actually said was it's a worthwhile thought, but the approach that I've taken, I, Joe Biden, have taken uh, has actually helped generate results. It has been high level presidential diplomacy, well, deep, he said personal and oftentimes it wouldn't have gotten private us where we are now. that has led to a deep personal and private engagement that has led to uh, a substantial and increasing amount of humanitarian assistance going into Gaza. Thousands of foreign nationals, including American citizens, being able to depart safely from Gaza, a pause in the fighting for the first time since the conflict began, and a hostage deal that is bringing hostages home to their loved ones after 50 days. That has all been the result of what President Biden has described as the approach that he has taken in this conflict. And when he answered that question, he acknowledged the idea, but then he said in the same breath, that the approach that he has taken is what has been generating results. Are you saying that what the president was indicating was no, there won't be any restrictions? No, uh, we all saw what he said. He acknowledged the so idea. So there might be restrictions? And then he said, but the approach I'm taking... Margaret, the president made clear in his comments that he thought the approach that he is taking is the approach that has generated the results that we have seen so far. And he is going to continue to engage in exactly that kind of diplomacy. In fact, he has okay. a call set up for today with Prime Minister Netanyahu. And I think you will see the United States continue to do what we have been doing, and particularly President Biden continue to do what he is doing, because that is what is generating results. We pressed the White House to clarify this Thank point. Um, two things here. The president uh, called conditional aid for Israel a worthwhile thought. Is he actually considering conditioning aid or not. What he also said, right after uh, acknowledging that it was a worthwhile thought, was that the approach he has chosen to take so far has produced results and outcomes. Many of them I just walked you through in my opening statement. Um, so the approach that we're taking with Israel and quite frankly with our partners in the region uh, is working. It's getting aid in to people that need it. It's getting a pause in the fighting. It's getting hostages out. It's getting Americans out. Uh, and quite frankly, we continue to urge and will continue to urge the Israelis as they conduct military operations to do so with the utmost care for innocent civilian so life. Democrats in, the part, in his party who say we need to start conditioning aid going forward, what would he say? I think he would say exactly what he said to you all yesterday when he got asked this question. Uh, it's a worthwhile thought, but the approach that I'm taking now is working. The approach that we're taking now is working. It's getting results. This debate among Democrats is a reminder that no matter what happens in the Middle East, it's ultimately going to reflect in part on President Biden. 
Now, let's turn to another issue that continues to cause concern for Americans across the country, gun violence and how it might potentially show up at the polls next year. Listen to Kylie Osage and her experience with school shootings in Michigan and what she's now advocating for. At 19 years old, Kylie Osage is the survivor of two school shootings. The first in 2021 at Oxford High School in Michigan that killed four of her classmates and left her temporarily paralyzed when a bullet pierced her collarbone and went out her back. I was kind of like hitting my legs and I couldn't feel my legs um, because at the time I didn't know but my spine was affected. So I was kind of just laying in the school helpless for about 15 minutes. After emergency surgery and months of rehabilitation, Osage still suffered from debilitating back pain. In July, she came to the doctors at Lenox Hill Hospital for spinal fusion surgery and returned Tuesday to thank them while stressing the need for gun prevention. I think by sharing my story, it's kind of a wake up call in a sense. According to the CDC, guns have become the leading cause of death for U.S. children and teenagers. In fact, just 14 months after getting shot, Osage was a freshman at Michigan State University when another shooter opened fire on campus. It is preventable. Firearm safety counseling from a doctor to a patient, a family. Um, violence prevention. These things are evidence-based. We're more worried about medical records getting in the wrong hands or, you know, if God forbid someone saw her x-rays and shouldn't see them, that's more dangerous to her than the shooter. That's just crazy. Osage says it's the thought of the four classmates she lost that powers her to keep fighting on. I feel like I can talk to them every day and I know that this is what they would want me to be doing. They would want me to take care of myself. They would want me to continue to spread positivity. They would want me to advocate for safer gun laws. By encouraging the country to start viewing gun violence as a public health issue rather than a divisive political one. Our thanks to Christina Fan of CBS New York for that report. Now, let's check in with the Republicans running for president. On the issue of gun violence, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie says mental health is at the root of it. The, the mental health issues uh, drive all of that, um, all of those other problems, whether it's addiction, uh, domestic violence, yeah. um, and, and, and all of those are contributed to by poverty. Yeah. Because the stress that that places on someone's life and right. places on their psyche, their own self-image, mm -hmm. um, and all those things are things that we have to deal with. And when you look at what happened up in Lewiston, mm -hmm. you know, that was a failure of the system. Yeah. I mean, the family told people about their concerns. Yeah. His employer told people about yeah. their concerns, and yet the system didn't respond. Christie spoke in New Hampshire, where he's put most of his focus. The others are splitting their time between the Granite State and Iowa, like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who's struggling in both states. No, look, you, you got to get out there and do it. We're going to get out there a lot um, over the next uh, 60, 65 days before you, know, you have the primary. Uh, we're going to start doing some of the things we've done in Iowa there. I think it's a little bit la later breaking uh, process than maybe Iowa is, and so we've approached it with that way. But it's important, and you'll see a lot of us, so you'll see us there a lot. Out on the trail, what candidates would do about foreign policy is earning more attention given the Middle East conflict. Here's former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley sharing her thoughts on how the U.S. should help out allies. I will be the first one to tell you, I don't believe in giving any cash to any country. I don't like when you can't hold things accountable. I don't think we should ever give cash to any country. We don't need to put troops on the ground there. What we need to do is make sure they have the equipment and ammunition to win. Former President Donald Trump visited Texas to be officially endorsed by Texas Governor Greg Abbott. We need a president who's going to restore world peace as opposed to this outbreak of warfare under Joe Biden. We need Donald J. Trump back as our president of the United States of America. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. It's a, a tremendous honor to get that endorsement in particular because he really stepped up. He stepped up to the plate. He's doing the job of what the federal government is supposed to be doing. And I'm just telling you, Mr. Governor, I am going to make your job much easier. And to round things out on the GOP front, businessman Vivek Ramaswamy trying to do what many in the Republican Party are doing these days, 
praising former President Donald Trump for things he's done in the past, but suggesting it might be time for something new. And I think most voters have an open mind, and there's two America First candidates in this race. That's Donald Trump and myself. And so it doesn't surprise me that there's a lot of voters who are gravitating to those two America First candidates. They have an important choice to make on the 15. I'm not going to guide them to make that choice by bashing Donald Trump. As I said, I'm respecting his legacy, that's the right thing to do. So now let's take a look at some things to keep an eye out for in the coming days. First, that ongoing debate at the White House and on Capitol Hill about whether or not conditions have to be added to future aid for Israel. It was something that Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders talked about this week on America Decides. Look, Israel was attacked in an absolutely horrific way by Hamas. 1,300 innocent people were slaughtered. Israel has a right to defend itself. But what Israel does not have a right to do, in my view, is to kill 12,000 people in six, seven weeks, two-thirds of whom are women and children. That they don't have a right to do. That's a violation of international law. Uh, the United States has always provided support for Israel. I think we have to continue to make sure that Israel can defend itself. But we also have a right to say to Israel, I'm sorry, you can't just do all kinds of bombing uh, which are killing innocent uh, men, women, and children. And also, in talking to a very right-wing Netanyahu government, we have got to say, you know what, we need some thoughts and moving move, movement forward toward a two-state solution to deal with the crisis in the West Bank where Palestinians are being thrown off of their land and are being killed. So we need, in my view, to say, if you want money from the United States, you know what, you've got to hear what we want as well. We just can't get a blank check. And retiring Republican Congressman Ken Buck of Colorado touched on the issue of funding for Ukraine on Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan. I think it's absolutely essential to get aid to Ukraine. I think President Biden has slow walked different types of military equipment that Ukraine has needed, and we need to make sure that they have the very best equipment um, and support that we can give them in, in fighting the Russians. I hope it gets done. The question, uh, Margaret, is always where does the money come from? And so to uh, expect that the Democrats help us find ways to pay for the Israel aid and the Ukraine aid, I think is absolutely fair. We need to work together to find ways to pay for this aid and then to make sure that both the Israel aid and the Ukraine aid are, are sent to those countries. Our thanks to Congressman Ken Buck, a key member of the Freedom Caucus, longtime conservative leader, but he's retiring after next year, meaning here in Colorado there's going to be at least two competitive congressional races. The one to replace him and the other involves the sitting congresswoman Lauren Boebert. You may know her. President, Democrats call her part of the extreme MAGA wing of the Republican Party. Republicans see her as a pretty active and vocal supporter of President Trump. She only won re-election last year by about 500 votes and change. And so Democrats look at her seat and say, we got a chance to win that one when they only have to flip about five seats to take back control of the House. So that's why President Biden came here, in part to call her out and her opposition to legislation that's been passed in recent years he thinks is designed to help the economy. The historic investments we're celebrating today is in Congressman Boebert's district. <laughs> She's one of the leaders of this extreme mega movement. The president was also here to raise money for his re-election campaign. We talked about all of this with our CBS Denver station, KCNC. Senior White House correspondent Ed O'Keefe is in Colorado tonight, preparing, of course, to cover the president's visit. So, Ed, thanks for being here, first of all. Why did the White House pick Pueblo? Well, uh, it has less to do with White House politics, more to do with congressional politics. Lauren Boebert, of course, won a tight uh, race last year, only a few hundred votes. The White House and congressional Democrats believe it's when they can win next year. So what he's trying to do across the country in different ways mm -hmm. is visit congressional districts where either a Democrat's on the ropes or where they'd like to pick up the seat. And Pueblo's a good example of that, believing that Congresswoman Boebert, he'll call her an extreme MAGA Republican, uh, someone who's opposed to the agenda they're trying to implement. And it's an excuse for him to come to a relatively blue state and talk about his accomplishments, remind people of those, while also raising a lot of money tonight here in the Denver area. 
Ed, what else do you think he'll be focusing on and you as you cover it and his reporting tonight? Well, you know, be curious to see if he makes any changes in sort of how he's talking about what has been done and what else he'd like to do going forward. There's been a lot of uh, polling done, a lot of reports about how he sort of is slipping in popularity or there's concerns about whether he's properly overseeing the economy or trying to, to boost the economy. And so does he change anything he says while visiting Pueblo to sort of describe that? And then also, how does he call out Congresswoman Boebert? Uh, and, and what does he suggest a Democratic-led House would do differently? That's a big part of the pitch, obviously, while he's here. Lots to keep an eye on as campaign 2024 continues. Only about a month to go until 2024, and then we really are off to the races. If you like what you saw here this week, don't forget to subscribe and like this video. And keep with us as CBS News continues tracking how America decides.